lot of times um, for kids, especially if they're deaf in the family and single parent stuff. Um, I was sexually abused for two years in my Episcopal church, but in the mission church um, in South Mexico. And it was by one of the elders in the church. And what I didn't know um, at that time and going through it, and listen, there was a lot of great gifts I learned about community. There was some bad stuff, but there was some beautiful stuff. And a lot of people helping out, too. But that, that was something I held in common with most of the women that were walking the streets, which is why a lot of us in some of the broken places in our lives are drawn into that ministry and to see it um, heal and to see it be resurrected into something beautiful. So um, the average age that a woman who is coming into Magdalene is usually sexually, or on average, is sexually abused between the average of age, between the ages of 7 and 11. So when you were talking about the women that you were serving as a uh, you know, the truth is, is that most of the women, before they ever get to the courts, have already seen the short side of justice, the underside of bridges, and the back side of anger. You know, and it is a hard life, not just on the streets, but a lot of times, and there are a lot of traumatic incidences that help invite people to the streets. So, we opened up the first house, and the women came in, and I realized about kind of how powerful it can be to invite people into a community together and to have really no authority within that community. We have people who are very big helpers. We have social workers. We have like the mental health workers. We have, you know, we have all kinds of people now. Chemists. We have all kinds of folks that help out. But literally the idea was that the house would be a two-year home that you could live in free. And I really did think I learned that as a kid, that sometimes people tell you the things that you value the most, you have to pay for them to really value them. And for me, it was always like the free stuff was the most valuable and the most precious thing that anybody could ever do for me. So to take the strain of money out, and if you sexualize kids at fairly young ages, you know, to also monetize relationships becomes really, really dangerous. And then also to take the authority figure out of the house. I think out of my own experience, I always had a fairly unhealthy or healthy, depending on who I was with, distrust of authority. And it served me pretty well sometimes in being able to read a room or understand where I am in a space, but it hadn't always worked well with bishops. <laughs> <laughs> Which is how I started out as a chaplain, and I've ended up as a chaplain. It's about the longest you can get in a hierarchy of Episcopal Church. <laughs> <laughs> See, you can only tell that joke in an Episcopal church. Right? <laughs> if I was in a Baptist church, I'd be like, what? <laughs> and then the other thing was um, that it needed to be a space where people got to define what safety looked like and people got to have control over their story. So we did that and we opened up house after house. We have six homes now. It's um, been a great, great gift. And about 2001, we learned that women were getting free and sober, doing amazing things, lots and lots of healing, can't get a job. So if you're thinking about the unemployment, is on average, whatever, 9.3%. For the community that we were serving, it was about 90, 92%. And if you have, you know, a lot of arrests and, you know, felonies on most people's records, it's really, really hard to get jobs. So that's why we decided to open up our own bath and body care company. And we really wanted to do something that was about healing the body and doing something beautiful that's healing for the earth, which is why they're all natural. And we started off right in the heart of the Vanderbilt campus. And we started making body bombs and candles. They're easy to make. And if anybody ever wants to learn how to make them, come up. We'll share the recipe and show you how to do it. Except it looks more intimidating now because as of this year, we do have a machine. <laughs> comes out of like a root meal. <laughs> so we can make 105 candles in less than 30 minutes. And this is the first time it's ever been like this. Ever, ever, ever. But um, one of the women that does a lot of the training said, we haven't even cranked up that bad boy. So <laughs> it's a big machine. So if we get, you know, one of the questions when you start a social enterprise, everybody asks is, well, if you got a huge order, can you fill it? And we're like, yeah. We can't. We have all our manufacturing down. So we started this bath and body care company, and we have just 
really um, watched. We have watched the power of love just kind of overflow and it's undone. I can't even tell you. It's the richest part of my life. We prayed for a building. We were out in a church called St. George's and there were about 23 of us and um, about 17 square feet working, making all those products, and we got a gift this year of a million and a half dollars to do the building, and we have an actual manufacturing company now, and you walk in and it's stunning, and the day after, maybe two days after we got the building, a woman that was a volunteer, she was working at Nissan, said these are the kind of tables you need, and she sent me a picture of the table, and they were about $25,000. And it was like, well, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, whatever. And um, we've been, you know, we've been doing it on a card table. And the next day, I happened to be at an event at a place called the Environmental Science Labs in Hendersonville, Tennessee. And everybody was walking around their lab. Um, and they had a lunch, and they all had lab coats on. And I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, because everybody always says, you know, what can we do to help? And I'm like, we would love some lab coats. So we would look like the Clinique women at the mall. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. <laughs> and, and that, uh, the owner of the company, who I've never met in my life, said, well, we rent these lab coats. We can't have our lab coats. But we have just redesigned our lab, and we have 15 lab tables that we're no longer using. And they were the same exact tables in the email that I got the night before with the wheels on them and the electricity and all metal that can be completely wiped down and sanitary. And I was like, <laughs> 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 we want these tables. And it was been like that since then. That is how it has been. That's all I can tell you is how it's been. And the experience that I want to talk about tonight is that all along the way, the gift has been for me. Coming here and being in the environment I'm in every day in Nashville, that I get to preach what I believe. And I know that is the biggest gift you can ask for, right? <laughs> Part of the, the um, lesson of the Sermon on the Mount is in the Beatitudes of believing in the blessing that could be broken. And of all the success that we've had in Magdalene, we've had. 150 women who have come through the program, 70% of the women who come into my room are clean and sober two and a half years after they enter the program. But I've learned probably more from the brokenness I've seen than the success I've seen. And, um, you know, there um, was a woman in Nashville, Tennessee, who was murdered this summer on the street. And what happened was, it was July 4th, and there was a news report that there was a woman beaten to death on the street, <coughs> but they couldn't identify her. And um, about, I didn't really even think about it. I just didn't even think about it. And about three days later, it came out that it was a woman named Roslyn. And Roslyn had been um, a graduate of the Magdalene program. And she had lived with us. She was a very faithful woman. She was actually a fairly prudish, conservative Woman. Um, she was um, African American Church of Christ, I mean, which is not messing around. And she worried about us, and she worried about our language sometimes. She worried about how we were in the world and if we were really um, living out what she understood the gospel message to be. And um, after she left the program, she worked, she was doing pretty well, and then she got in a really bad relationship. The guy was selling drugs out of her house, and pretty soon she was just a part of it again. And if you use, and if you're using, you know, the drug and the sex industry are married to each other. And she was on the street doing crack cocaine, and she was beaten so bad that no one could recognize her. And when I started think about her, talk about her, I realized that it's almost too much to ask anybody to do for her. Because 
there's so much, <coughs> there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of people who die of violent death. If you don't know somebody, you can't, you know, really um, grieve them because there's too much other stuff in your life to grieve. There's too much judgment on that. If somebody chooses to use crack cocaine and get in and go to the street, they're getting what they ask for. If people work their program, it'll work for them. All these things. And what I realized was that in believing ultimately in the gift of the Beatitudes preached by Jesus, that grieving Rosalind is a luxury. That if you allow yourself to really em embrace her humanity and her personhood and her work and that she was beaten on the street and probably the fear that she had and the um, loneliness at the end of it to stand with our Lord and breathe that is a luxury that we do not allow ourselves very often. And that when we breathe things fully we also get to celebrate the truth of what it is. To me, Rosalind's truth is that that doesn't get the last word and that doesn't define her. But because I have this beautiful beatitude, that even in the sorrow and the brokenness and the horrible stuff that looks like it gets the last word, there's something bigger. And that Rosalind's spirit and Rosalind's life and Rosalind's witness makes it down to Birmingham, Tennessee. You get her name in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> we get to speak her name and talk about it. And free ourselves just from that being the last word in this world. And I'm thinking of um, Peggy Sue who died, and she um, was one of the women that you know, died in state custody with her legs shackled to a bed and a feeding tube in her. And when she died and we did her funeral, I promise you, I bet I've done. I know, a hundred funerals, and it's the one I've been the most scared to do, and to me, that was the one that was preaching, if you have a really horrible childhood, and you end up with a really bad drug addiction, then the world will lay on your back and break you, and she was about 85 pounds when she died, and then was, we got her ass a small cardboard box and there was about six of us gathered and we just said, you know, there was nothing. I mean, it was like this. There was no video. <laughs> just like this. <laughs> and we just stood there and decided we were going to do the funeral just like this. With no problem. And we just had a box and somebody's going to say a prayer, somebody's going to read something, somebody's going to Thank you.